biblical archaeology and history has raised some very interesting and educational points concerning biblical archaeology. He was the professor of Old Testament and archaeology at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. He earned his Ph.D. at the University of California and his Th.D. at Harvard in Semitic Studies. From 1961 to 1965, for four years, he was the director of the American School of Oriental Research in Jerusalem, and he served as the archaeological consultant to the U.S. Agency for International Development in Jordan. In other words, he is a very solid scholar. His analysis of the biblical archaeology question is extremely interesting. While most archaeologists that I've studied and read advocate that archaeology can give us some generalized overview about the history of the Old Testament or the history of the ancient Middle East, none of them demonstrate that archaeology proves a lot. Because the assumption of proof being a scholarly acceptance and basically a uniform understanding of all the material of the cultural remains in the ancient Near East simply doesn't exist. And he notes this, we must, on page 22, we must emphasize the limitations of archaeology. There is a vast chasm between the words of the most unimaginative written source and the stones of an uninscribed building, however magnificent. It is only when written documents appear that history begins. Much of the archaeological material from the biblical period in Palestine cannot be directly related to texts and remains sub-historical. This means that most of the time, the Palestinian archaeologist must content himself with contributions that supplement and complement written historical sources. Archaeology remains a secondary historical discipline, although at times it produces primary historical documents. Now that's a significant point that most people are not aware of concerning the nature of biblical archaeology. He says on page 25, after defining his subject, the historian must limit must delimit and critically examine his sources. When you get to an ancient source like the Bible, the task of critical examination is fairly obvious, he notes. Statements about the sun standing still, sticks turning to serpents, and angels slaying armies require critical understanding. The task is not an easy one. There is no clear-cut method or set of principles by which the authentic elements in various accounts can be determined by any kind of scholarly consensus. Again, the biblical scholars do not deal with this idea of physical proof or understanding that however the discoveries and the remains of biblical archaeology are understood, not everyone agrees with what the evidence means. It must be interpreted and critically explored. And no two scholars are agreeing based on what I've read so far. In chapter 2, Dr. Lapp indicates the Christian Bible is a source book of history, but it's not a history book. Although it provides the chief and sometimes the only sources for the history of Palestine in the biblical period, it was not written as a history, and is at best is a compilation of other sources. Unfortunately for historians and for us, the biblical sources were not simply written down. Most of them passed through centuries of written transmission and re-editing, and before that some time of them had passed through even longer periods of oral transmission. It is generally agreed by Bible scholars that the earliest editor or redactor worked at least some 400 years before the last, and some of the events described in the Bible are commonly assigned to a period at least 800 years before the time of the first editor of the Bible. There's an 800-year gap 
The historian has before him the end product of centuries of oral and written transmission. While some traces of transmission are detectable, the identification of the steps of transmission back to the original event are irrecoverable, he says. If we turn to the works of the Deuteronomist and the Chronicler, for example, we are dealing with descriptions of events written down in final form, for the most part, centuries after the event. Can archaeological discoveries substantiate the historical accuracy of the Bible, he asks on page 89. On the basis of almost every individual facet of the discussion, this question should be answered with a resounding no. Notice this, the historical accuracy of the Bible, he says, cannot be answered with a resounding no. The comparatively few final excavation reports trustworthy by present standards, the uncontrolled and minimal, minimal sampling of the evidence, the relatively few archaeologists who have mastered Palestinian typology, the virtual lack of epigraphic evidence, the, post, the postulational nature of the relation between the material evidence and the written sources, and the very difficulty of excavating itself a mound layer by layer in the first place, all characterize the evidence from archaeology as being of a hypothetical nature. There's nothing to be proven through this scientific discipline. It's all hypothetical. A best hypothesis to explain the available data is possible, but to call this the truth or to attribute to such evidence the power to authenticate, to verify, or to prove the accuracy of the Bible is an entirely different matter. It is against the very nature of biblical archaeological evidence to propose that archaeology confirms the book of books. Such a perspective betrays a complete lack of understanding of archaeological evidence, and even worse, it is a radically wrong-headed comprehension of the biblical sources themselves. The biblical records partake of the same characteristics and limitations as the other historical sources. It is not their nature to be true or false. Are you catching this? This is how a biblical scholar, an archaeologist, understands the issue. You notice how completely different he is from the anti-Mormon's assumptions and assertions about biblical archaeology proving the Bible? This is critical to catch. We can develop a best hypothesis in analyzing the biblical sources, but truth is quite something else. The contention that archaeological evidence substantiates the historical truth of the Bible shows a complete misunderstanding of archaeology and of the Bible. And that's what I've been proposing about the anti-Mormon assumptions. Not only do they not understand archaeology, they don't even understand the Bible. And now Paul W. Lapp says the same thing about people who believe archaeology proves the Bible true. And he is a serious biblical archaeologist. No, I'm not. I'm not a biblical archaeologist. I don't claim to be. I know the anti-Mormons aren't. The difference between me and the anti-Mormons is I read the biblical archaeologists. I know what biblical archaeology is, does, and can accomplish. And I don't think the anti-Mormons do. He goes on to say further on page 90, what about the assertion... Notice he calls it the assertion here. What about the assertion that this purported accuracy of the Bible is a vindication of the Christian faith? To me, this displays a complete failure to grasp the nature of the Christian faith. It is the height of sacrilege to suggest, to think, that archaeologists, in their layers of dirt and tatters of walls, would have a key to answering the question, is the Christian faith in God true? <laughs> That's sacrilege, according to Paul W. Lapp. It is veritably the idolatry of falling down and worshiping stones or archaeology.
if a Palestinian archaeologist controlled material decisive for determining whether the Christian faith is vindicated for our time, perhaps he should be considered the God behind God. Wow, what a slap to the anti-Mormon argument about biblical archaeology. St. Paul had the insight that faith is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If man has vindicated faith in the Christian's God by his archaeological efforts or his rational excursions, he has actually undermined faith, transformed it into something other than a gift. This gift of Christian faith has been accepted by a long procession of believers in times of the Old Testament, through the Christian centuries, and even by some living among us today. There is contemporary research that can delimit and define the gift or even prove that it exists. There is no objective way to decide whether it is true or false. Only you may know or may not know the truth of this gift in your own heart. That is precisely what I've been advocating. Paul W. Lapp says the same thing in words far more powerful than I do with the full weight of biblical archaeology and biblical scholarship behind him. I know the Anamormans are going to ignore me, but what about Paul W. Lapp, who happens to be one of their supposed authorities on this subject that they ignore? Is it any wonder they ignore him? <laughs> he says in chapter 4, page 93, Some scholars consider that the history of the biblical period begins with the patriarchs about 2000 B.C. For others, it does not begin until the Israelite tribes are in Palestine about 1200 B.C. Well, that's an 800-year gap. This fact would seem to underlie what has been said about the extreme limitations of archaeological evidence. The great imponderables of the historical sources and the facets of man himself which remain beyond his grasp. What is the historian to do in the face of such a divergent interpretation of his material by competent specialists in the field? He's asking this for a very important reason because there is no uniformity of thought or interpretation of either the Bible or the archaeological record. So what are we supposed to do in this instance? Two things seem required. He must adopt an interpretive approach and he must determine a method for presenting his interpretations. His interpretive approach will be at some point along a positive-negative continuum. He does want to emphasize more the vastness of ignorance about what he is writing, or the amazing amount of detailed information that is available on his subject. Does he want to emphasize the heterogeneous opinions held by writers on his subject? Or does he wish to present a closely argued case for the view he considers most cogent? Does he consider the contributions of archaeology to the historical sources with a basic skepticism? Or does he attempt to maximize the links between the archaeological results and the historical sources? His position on questions like these determines his basic approach in writing his history. You notice there's nothing objective here? He picks and chooses the type of writing and the type of way he's going to emphasize his subject. It's pure interpretation. It's pure bias understanding. There's nothing here about proof. He's not saying, does he present the proof of the Bible being true to all of his colleagues and they all agree? That's not how it works. As such, they are at the same time as much a reflection of his own character as they are of his competence in dealing with the evidence. Yeah, not all archaeologists have the same competence to deal with the evidence, let alone find it and interpret it. The approach inevitably reflects his own degree of either optimism or pessimism about understanding man, including himself. 
we simply are not dealing with proof when it comes to biblical archaeology in any manner on anything. He asks other very pertinent questions, and I've noticed this about the biblical archaeologists. They ask far more questions than they answer. For every discovery they make, for every interpretation that is presented about what does the evidence demonstrate about this or that, for every one of those presentations, they get dozens of more questions that are unanswered, and in many cases, unanswerable. Listen to Paul W. Lapp. What does this mean for our search for connections between the historical, archaeological, and the biblical material concerning the patriarchs? There do seem to be broad general connections between the patriarchal stories and their asserted Mesopotamian background. If the patriarchs were not historical persons, they were certainly described as an authentic part of the world out of which they are purported to come. More than this, it's hard to say because no historical or archaeological evidence offers direct links with the patriarchs. There's nothing from a biblical archaeological stance that links the patriarchs with real history. Nothing. If we attempt to link the patriarchs with the archaeological evidence from Palestine, he says, we are in a still more difficult position. You see, he's not talking about proving anything. It's even more difficult to tie them with the biblical record. For it is not agreed by specialists to which archaeologically defined group of people in Palestine the patriarch should be assigned. We don't even know their own people yet. Under such circumstances, it is hardly appropriate to say that the history of the biblical period begins about 2000 BC, since it has so far proved impossible. Now, here he uses the word proved, but not in a positive manner. It has proved impossible to place the events of the patriarchal narratives into a coherent and concise chronological framework that can hardly be considered historical. There are still an unpenetrated veil between the patriarchal traditions and the historical events which lie behind them. This is the talk of biblical scholarship. This is the fundamental ground reality. This is the basis of my saying, no biblical archaeologist says the Bible has been proven. For the simple fact of the reality is, it hasn't been proven. It is proven impossible to link the archaeological data with the biblical story. That's what the scholars and archaeologists are saying. He further notes on page 106, he says, does this mean that the historian should ignore the patriarchal narratives in his construction of a history of the biblical period? It is quite legitimate for Martin Noth to utilize the later elements of the history in the formation and developing the history of the period of the tribal league. In other words, you use the later history to bring to bear on the evidence for the earlier history. Well, this is what Hugh Nibley, the great LDS scholar, has done with Book of Mormon studies, with Biblical studies, with the Pearl of Great Price studies, and he's taken it in the teeth for using this scholarly methodology. But this is the scholar's method, and it's perfectly legitimate. The character of the sources is such that there are legitimate hopes that stronger historical and archaeological links before this time will be forthcoming. Meanwhile, it is salutary for scholars to sift and re-sift the evidence. The final interpretation of the evidence is not in. There is no proof. We may be very well wrong in the interpretation of what we think reality was in the ancient Bible world. It is legitimate and salutary for historians to formulate and reformulate better and better hypotheses to interpret the evidence and for archaeologists to continue to excavate 
with a view to producing a new material to bring the patriarchs into clearer historical perspective. But we don't have that right now. There is no proof. This conclusion is in sympathy with both Moth and John Bright. Noth is correct in his contention that nothing concrete can be said about the history of Israel before 1200 B.C. Now that should give the Anamorman critics pause. That eliminates almost half the Old Testament. What I have found is that every biblical archaeologist and scholar I'm reading, and it doesn't matter whether they're Christian or Jewish, it really is irrelevant to their faith what they're saying, None of them are indicating the Bible is complete. None of them are indicating there has been a complete accepted conclusion of the meaning of archaeology and what it proves and doesn't prove. They're all looking for plausibility and possibility. And they're reviewing and re-reviewing and reinterpreting the evidence. There's no point in me quoting 50 sources to you and boring you stiff. Paul W. Lapp is a beautiful representative of the actual biblical archaeological enterprise. I can't stop this series of videos, however, without mentioning a book by Magnus Magnuson, Archaeology of the Bible. What he does, and you can see all the tabs that I've got in it, all these white tabs on top, there's at least 30. And what Magnuson has done is he has discussed the various studies of the ancient Near East, and he has analyzed the supposed archaeological information on this, and he gives a comparison and a contrasting views of different interpretations. That's what his entire book is about. In fact, James Pritchard in the preface said, the new increment to the knowledge of the past has demanded a reassessment of the older sources and evoked widely differing opinions about the significance of that material. That is the whole point of Magnuson's 200 page book. He shows all the way through the biblical history from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. That one, one archaeologi archaeologist will say this about some kind of an evidence about some aspect in the Bible, and another one will say, well, no, that's not what it means. It means this. Someone will say, well, yes, this is the basis of the history. This is historically demonstrated and, and plausible. Another one will say, no, you're ignoring this evidence or else you're interpreting that evidence wrong. This is what it means. He absolutely establishes that there is no consensus of opinion about any aspect of the Bible or the ancient Near Eastern history. There is fundamentally no discourse. It's not even their philosophy. They don't even think in these terms of proving and having had proven and all of the other scholars looking at the evidence and saying, oh, well, yeah, there it is. There's your proof. We all accept that interpretation. That simply does not exist in the real world of biblical archaeology and biblical history. No two scholars agree with the evidence. They are still finding new evidence and what's also changing the picture is they're taking another look at the evidence and interpretations that had occurred 100, 50, 20 years ago, and they're coming to different conclusions today than what the former biblical scholars and archaeologists had 100 years ago. It's all fluid. It's all movement. It's all changing. Nothing has stopped. Nothing has become final. It has not ended. It is not over. What we find tomorrow could very well change what we believe the Bible means today. That's the point. Proof is virtually impossible. That's the reality. Anyone who tells you otherwise doesn't have a clue what they're talking about. They truly don't. They are completely bankrupt of logic. They really are completely ignorant 
of the true situation and the true nature and what the biblical archaeologists are trying to understand with the biblical record and with the archaeological remains. We're not finished any more than we're finished with the Book of Mormon or the Pearl of Great Price or any of the scriptures of the ancient world. The Dead Sea Scrolls, there's been no finality with the Dead Sea Scrolls yet. There's still much work to do on those. Someone who comes along and says, the Dead Sea Scrolls absolutely prove the Bible, haven't got a clue about the nature of the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Bible. And I have lots of evidence for that as well from the Dead Sea Scroll scholars. So if you think you're going to gain something by listening to the Anti-Mormon argument on this, on the biblical archaeology, and you're going to accept their view, you're simply exchanging your Mormon ignorance for the Anti-Mormon ignorance. The only difference between the Mormon ignorance and the anti-Mormon ignorance is that the Mormon ignorance is an informed ignorance. The anti-Mormon ignorance is just pure ignorance. That's the substantial difference. And finally, I want to describe one of the negative aspects of biblical archaeology against the anti-Mormon argument that you will never see them discuss or present. And it is valid biblical scholarship and biblical archaeology. I have said it before and I will say it again and again and again. Biblical archaeology is not a good discipline to place your faith in for the substantiality of the Bible because biblical archaeology has come up with some interpretations that are positively shocking for the Christian world and for the Bible. Through a careful analysis of the biblical archaeological remains as well as the interpretation of the biblical text in light of other ancient texts some of the material remains that the biblical archaeologists have found, one of my favorite examples, is William G. Dever. Did God have a wife? Archaeology and folk religion in ancient Israel. And his conclusion, based upon the evidence, is that God was married. And he means the God of the Bible, Yahweh. He's absolutely serious. That doctrine, as it were, would be seriously uncomfortable for any anti-Mormon critic I'm aware of. But it's not for we Mormons. What are you going to do with this part of biblical archaeology? Ignore it? Hoping that by ignoring it, it will disappear and go away. You can't accuse Dever of being a Mormon scholar. He's not Mormon. He doesn't have Mormonism in mind. What are you going to do with that, you see? Another very interesting book is by Mark S. Smith. The second edition, I have both the first and second editions, The Early History of God... Yahweh and the other deities in ancient Israel, where Smith, using the analysis and interpretation of what the ancient texts around the area of ancient Israel meant, as well as the biblical text itself, is that there were other deities in existence before and beside Yahweh. What are you going to do with that biblical archaeology and scholarship? Ignore it. Another text that just came out ten years ago was the origins of biblical monotheism, Israel's polytheistic background, and the Ugaritic texts by Mark S. Smith. 
he demonstrates that the belief in deity in ancient Israel was not monotheism. It was polytheism. There was a council of the gods. There were multitudinous gods. And Mark Smith demonstrates that with archaeology and the ancient texts. And then he rereads the Bible and he finds that it is hinted at in the Bible. It was an ancient Israelite belief. What are you going to do with this interpretation of biblical archaeology? Accuse him of being a Mormon? That won't work. He's not Mormon. Accuse him of being secretly paid by the church to come to that conclusion? Don't be stupid. I know your argument's stupid, but don't you be stupid and come up with such desperate silliness. Another text is Raphael Patai, the Hebrew goddess. It went through three different editions where he demonstrates in ancient Israel there really was a Hebrew goddess and she was worshipped in ancient Israel and she's mentioned in the Bible. He describes how the biblical writers rewrote the story to be a negative against the goddess, but through the archaeological evidence, he shows how originally she really was worshipped and believed in. Finally, Frank Moore Cross, Canaanite myth and Hebrew epic. In this shocking book, Cross demonstrates that the ancient texts of antiquity, tying in with the Hebrew epic of the Old Testament, the background that the Bible leaves out is that the biblical god El, who was later fused with Yahweh, was actually married with plural wives and they had sex together and they produced children. Those children, that eternal family setting in the heavens, was the council of the gods. Now, would any anti-Mormon critic that you're aware of be comfortable with that biblical archaeological material? But we Mormons are. That doesn't bother us at all, because that's one of our doctrines, based on revelation through Joseph Smith the prophet. Do you ever see the Anna Mormons present this interpretation? Do you ever see Anna Mormons present this material as biblical archaeology, what it is demonstrating in the ancient world? No, you do not. So by selectively picking and choosing, they build up a completely false picture, not only of the Bible, but of ancient history and archaeology and Biblical archaeology. The Anamorman critics have nothing going for them with this biblical archaeology argument. If you're going to pay attention to them, good luck. You're seriously going to need it. All of this leads me to a conclusion that I'm going to say sincerely not blasphemously about the nature of the anti-Mormon mindset and the spirit in their souls. They don't care about your and my salvations. They don't care about your and my souls. I dare prophesy that the anti-Mormons are not going to accept the biblical proof as they say biblical archaeology proves the Bible true or proves any doctrines, the doctrines of the Council of the Gods is very firmly established right now in biblical scholarship because of biblical archaeology. The doctrine of multitudinous gods is 
absolutely established, there were many, many gods. Monotheism was not the original religion of Israel. It was polytheism. Biblical archaeology proves this through Mark S. Smith and Frank Moore Cross and William F. Albright, Michael Heiser's new doctoral dissertation. There's an enormous wealth of literature on this. The information that Frank Moore Cross has brought out, as well as Mark S. Smith, on God having sex with his numerous different wives, he was a polygamist, according to the biblical archaeologically discovered texts at Ugarit, and the scholarly translations thus far, we now know that God was a polygamist, that he had multitudinous wives, he produced children with them through sexual means, and that family, that eternal family in the heavens, constituted the council of the gods. This has been established through biblical archaeology. I will prophesy the anti-Mormons will not cease and desist their silly efforts against Mormonism, and they will not repent and join Mormonism, which is substantiated through biblical archaeology. They will either ignore this, or they will poo-poo it. They will label the scholars as being either liberal or socialists, or they'll do anything they can except accept the truth. You know why? Because the anti-Mormons are not interested in the truth. They will pick and choose what evidences they will accept, and they will ignore the others. They will advocate powerfully. Biblical archaeology proves the Bible and refutes Mormonism. But they will ignore William G. Dever, Frank Moore Cross, William F. Albright, Michael D. Heiser. They will not accept the biblical archaeological interpretations of these scholars based on the evidence. I predict they will not join Mormonism. If the anti-Mormons all sincerely join Mormonism because of this biblical archaeological proof of so many of the incredible Mormon doctrines that no anti-Mormon will ever accept as an anti-Mormon, that's my prediction. The anti-Mormons have no desire for the truth. Otherwise, they would join us, but they won't. They have their free will to. They have their free will to accept the evidence like they pretend they accept in favor of the Bible. They can accept this biblical archaeology evidence and realize the really supposed kooky art doctrines of Mormonism are actually biblically, archaeologically proven and join. But I prophesy they will not do so.